It is great to see all of you here tonight, or this afternoon, but I'm particularly honored to be able to welcome uh, Vice Chancellor Hilary Beckles as our speaker here this afternoon. Formally speaking, this event is a joint session of two workshops here at Harvard University, one of them on the history of capitalism and the other one on, the history of, on, on global history. The former workshop, the one on capitalism, focuses on disentangling the long history of capitalism and tries to infuse a historical perspective into our thinking about capitalism. The latter workshop focuses on new ways of studying history that leaves behind our attachment to national histories and instead tries to look at history through a global lens. It is obvious that few themes are more suitable to both these conversations than the study of the history of slavery. Atlantic slavery has played an important part in the vast economic expansion that took place in the Atlantic Basin since the 16th century. Indeed, slavery has been crucial to the unfolding of global capitalism, and no history of capitalism can ever be complete with, without encountering, accounting for the enslavement of millions of Africans in the New World. At the same time, the history of that enslavement is, um, enslavement is unfolding of capitalism, and slavery is clearly a global history. It, is, it connects Africa, Europe, and the Americas, and it is almost impossible to understand much about slavery without taking into view these various places and the diverse groups of actors within them. Today's speaker, Sir Hillary, has been at the forefront of invigorating both of these discussions. His work has charted in great detail the contributions of Atlantic slavery to the development of North Atlantic economies, and his writings have avoided narrow national perspectives in taking the Atlantic world as a whole into view. His writings have also been infused with great ethical and political energy, <clears throat> insisting, as he does, that history is not just about the past, but also about our present and very much about our futures. Even though Sir Hillary has assumed many important positions in academia and in politics, I like to think of him first and foremost as a historian, a historian whose voice joins a long line of distinguished thinkers, such as Eric Williams, W.E.B. Du Bois, Walter Rodney, and Eric Hobsbawm. A committed activist for social justice, Sir Hillary is among the most distinguished intellectuals in the Caribbean and a prolific scholar. Educated at the University of Hull in the United Kingdom, he holds a doctorate from the Department of Economic and Social History. As, and Sir Hillary began his academic career at the University of the West Indies as a senior lecturer in 1979. Named a senior research fellow at the London-based Institute of Commonwealth Studies in 1986, he served as chair of the history department at the University of the West Indies and later as a dean of the Faculty of Humanities. At age 37, he was granted a personal professorship, becoming the youngest appointment in the university's history. Since last year, Sir Hillary also serves as the vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, or what we would call here the president of the university. Sir Hillary authored many renowned books, including Britain's Black Debt, Reparations for Caribbean Slavery and Native Genocide, which was published in 2012, A History of Barbados from Amerindian Amer Settlement to Caribbean Single Market in 2006, and Liberties Lost, the Indigenous Caribbean and the Slave System in 2004. He also edited two volumes on the development of West Indian cricket, which were published in 1999. And he's the editor of the ninth volume of UNESCO's General History of Africa series, which he conceptualized around the theme of global history. Sir Hillary's scholarly, scholarly work has always combined, Sir Hillary has always combined his scholarly work with political engagement. In 2001, he headed the Barbados delegation to the World Conference Against Racism, and he has been vice president of the International Task Force for UNESCO's Slave Root Project, a consultant for UNESCO's Cities for Peace, and a member of the UN Secretary General's Scientific Advisory Board. 
He's also a keen cricket fan and has, uh, has had long-standing involvement with West Indian cricket, not least as the director of the West Indies Cricket World Cup, which took place in 2005 and 2007, and is a member of the West Indian Cricket Board. Sir Hillary, in 2007, was made a Knight of St. Andrew, the highest honor of the Order of Barbados for his contributions to higher education, the arts, and sports. And perhaps less well known is the fact that Sir Hillary also is an accomplished playwright with six plays staged to popular acclaim. <laughs> Professor Beckel's talk today will focus on the, sub on the subject of much of his research and of his political work, the history of slavery and the politics of reparations. As chairman of the Caribbean Commission on Reparations, Sir Hillary has been at the forefront of a re-emerging global conversations on the question of slavery reparations. This subject has, of course, great significance in Europe, in Africa, in the United States, and the Caribbean. But it also hits, it's, it's also a subject that hits close to home, both in a country that builds so much of its wealth on the backs of enslaved workers, and at a university whose own history is so deeply entangled with slavery. It is a great honor to be able to welcome Sir Hillary here today. Thank you so much, Master of Ceremonies, for your very generous uh, introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it, it is for me an, an honor and a privilege to be here uh, with you to have this conversation. Uh, this is not a lecture. Uh, this is what we call in the Caribbean a little old talk. <laughs> and uh, that is what it's going to be. And it really, really is truly a privilege and an honor to be here, to be here with you. We are fortunate to be living in times of great transformation. Uh, we have seen uh, in the last decade or so tremendous global changes. Uh, most of them, I believe, for the good, not all for the better. Uh, but we are living in a times of change and transformation. Uh, we are all hopeful that the world will evolve into a much better place for our children and our, our grandchildren. And uh, in this regard, uh, my own contribution to this reparatory global uh, discourse is to that objective. I, I do this daily because I am a positivist, I am an optimist, I am a humanist, and I believe that the world must be shaped by the finest thinking available to us so that we can enjoy whatever humanity has, has to offer. Recently, I was privileged to uh, be a part of a conversation uh, when the British Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Cameron, visited, visited Jamaica. It, it was an historic occasion. Uh, no British Prime Minister had visited the former British colonies in 15 years. Uh, he admitted uh, on his tour that, yes, Britain had neglected its former colonies in the Caribbean. Uh, he also admitted that that will change and that his visit was part of a new dialogue which was going to open between Britain and its former colonies in terms of a development strategy. That news was welcome uh, by the region. And not so welcome uh, was his idea that he did not wish to participate in a conversation about the history of Britain in the Caribbean. He did not wish to speak about slavery. He did not wish to speak of the colonial past. Uh, Britain had, had taken Jamaica from the Spanish in 16, 1655 and had ruled Jamaica until 1962 when Jamaica forcefully demanded, demanded its independence. And so he said, there will be no apology for slavery, there will be no conversation 
about reparatory justice. And this is, this is what he said. He said, I acknowledge that these wounds of slavery run very deep indeed. But I do not hope, but I do hope that as friends, and we have gone through so much together, <laughs> that those darkest of times are now behind us. And that we can move on from this painful point, from this legacy, and continue to build for the future. He promised 350 million pounds in Caribbean development projects for the region. He also promised 25 million pounds to build a prison to host Jamaican prisoners who would be repatriated from Britain and serve out their sentences back home. This relationship between the 350 million pounds for infrastructural works and 25 million pounds to build a prison <coughs> in Jamaica to allow Jamaica to accommodate Caribbean prisoners who ran afoul of British law created a remarkable conversation in the country and in the region. This 350 million pounds was defined as a down payment and the whole region wondered a down payment on what? The significance of it though was that Mr. Cameron, who is six generations removed from his ancestor, Sir James Duff, who had received two million pounds in contemporary money for the 202 slaves he owned in Jamaica. And the legacy of that massive compensation for slavery uh, has passed on to the prime minister. The question is, if we are going to move on, can we move on? without the two million pounds that his ancestors had received back then for the 202 Jamaican slaves that they had owned. Admittedly, Jamaica was the Caribbean's largest slave market. The British imported into Jamaica 1.3 million Africans. At the end of slavery in 1838, there were 300,000 remaining. The question has to be asked then, how do you reduce 1.3 million people to 300,000 after 200 years? Less than 25% survival. Slavery in Jamaica was genocidal. We understand then that when we speak of slavery in the context of Jamaica, in the aftermath of Mr. Cameron's speech, we are speaking also about the genocide on that island. Three months earlier, the French president, Mr. Hollande, had also visited a Caribbean colony in Guadeloupe. He too said, there will be no apology for slavery and there will be no reparations. But he was in Guadeloupe to open a multi-million euro museum dedicated to slavery as a gift from the people of France so that the African community in the French islands could see the horror of slavery displayed in their museum. He went on to add that France owes the people of the Caribbean a debt of gratitude. But this gratitude would not be expressed in either an apology or in any form of reparatory justice. All of this came against the background of what had transpired in 2001 when President Aristide of Haiti demanded the return of the 150 million francs that France had insisted that Haiti pay for their own self-liberation. Uh, you may recall that uh, Haiti had fought a war of liberation, uh, declared their independence on the 1st of January 1804. Uh, the Haitians were the first uh, people on this planet to give Napoleon Bonaparte a whipping. And in return for this whipping, uh, France insists 
that if the Haitians wish to be recognized as an independent nation state, they will have to pay compensation to their former enslavers. Uh, 1825, the Haitians are celebrating the 21st anniversary of their independence. France had refused to recognize Haiti as an independent nation. All the slave-owning nations of the Western world, Britain, Spain, Portugal, Holland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the United States, all said they will not recognize Haiti until the French recognize Haiti. The French said, if you want recognition, you pay for it. The Haitian people in 1825 had therefore a decision to make on their 21st anniversary. There were parties in Port-au-Prince, but there were also French gunboats in the harbor. The Haitian cabinet met and agreed that they wished to be reinserted into the international community, and this reinsertion would cost them 150 million francs, which is 21 billion US dollars in contemporary money. This money was paid, agreed to be paid, and was paid to the French government over 100 years. This extraction of economic value out of Haiti in the first 100 years of its nationhood crippled that nation. In some years in the 19th century, the payment to France in reparations accounted for 60 to 70 percent of the foreign exchange earnings of that nation. Aristide asks for the return of this money to the people of Haiti. He wrote to the French government, government to government, calling for the return of this money. The French government invaded Haiti, Aristide was overthrown and removed from office. His successor, his first public statement was that the claim for reparations and the repayment of this money was a criminal act and remove from the state. And therein was the end of that conversation. President Aristide had acted against the background of the UN conference in Durban in South Africa on race, xenophobia, and related intolerances. The American government under Bush had pulled out of this conference on the basis that any discussions around slavery and reparations were internal national issues and not to be ventilated in international fora. President Clinton had earlier expressed a statement of regret on behalf of the American state, but had also refused to apologize. President Obama followed the Bush-Clinton line and also indicated that there is no need for a formal apology. President Holland did state in Guadeloupe that history cannot be the subject of financial transactions. President Obama declared that the discourse on repara reparations and reparatory justice is divisive of the nation state. The Western world, therefore, seems united in its opposition to the concept of reparatory justice for the people of Africa. And so there seems to be a Euro-American alliance that stands in solidarity and opposition to justice for the enslaved peoples of the modern Western world. But yet, the conversation continues. It is growing in intensity. And as one of my colleagues have said in Guyana a few days ago, the water is boiling and someone will have to make the tea. <laughs> but the discourse is as predictable as it is despicable, claiming as it does an attachment to the values of democracy and the sensibility of democracy. The British formal position, let's all move on as friends, 
uh, the American position that it is divisive of nation building and therefore not in the national interest. Followed upon the British position in their parliament in 2008 when the British were celebrating the bicentenary of the abolition of their slave trade in 2008. The British House of Lords debated this matter. The conclusion of the House of Lords is that yes, slavery was a crime. Yes, slavery was an evil. And that the British state participated in a crime and in an act of evil. But there is nothing that can be done about it because the enormity of the crime is too large to contemplate. This crime, the global dimensions of it, the moral dimensions of it, the sheer evil of it, it is too large to contemplate reparatory action. In other words, according to the House of Lords, the crime is too big to be filed. And so we have two concepts. Too big to fail and too big to file. These are powerful concepts. They all speak to the existence of the powerless in societies and the face of national and global crimes. They all suggest that modern law, and we are here in Harvard Law, that modern law is crippled in the face of this crime. It is recognized that it is the greatest crime of modernity, but there is nothing that can be done. Law, philosophy, and politics have come to a gridlock in the face of the recognition of the crime. The challenge, though, philosophically and legally, is that democracy, we are told, cannot accommodate itself to reparatory justice for African folk. Too big to file. It all happened a long time ago. Let us move on. Have joined with some earlier concepts, such as, I cannot be held accountable for the crimes of my great-grandparents. And that there can be no resolution to this injustice all of us in the Western world then seem to have gone into a cul-de-sac and our intellectuals have not pointed the way out. Gridlock, therefore, seems to be the state of affairs in respect of democracy and reparatory justice. All of this, all of this has converged around the most extraordinary achievement of democracy the device we all know as the national interest. The national interest is a remarkable 17th century invention. It's an invention that enables the state and the powerful to make judgments on behalf of the powerless and to sustain their authority over time in the face of adversity and criticisms from the majority of peoples. It is a concept that is fluid, it is volatile, and it is commercially available. It's a concept that can go to the highest bidder, but prefers to be dressed in the finest and most sophisticated garments. It comes wrapped in beautiful legal and philosophical discourse, but in effect, it is a a device of the powerful, who defined for all of us what is in the national interest. So I wish to make a few comments then about the auctioning of this concept of the national interest. In the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a strong argument that said slavery was not in the national interest. Across European countries, there were conversations about what to do with this form of labor. In most countries of Europe, 
and also in the early years of the colonies of this country, there was a formulation about slavery as not in the national interest. The vast majority of citizens in Europe and also in these colonies would have argued that it is not for the betterment of mankind. We see a change in this concept in the middle of the 17th century when slavery is emerging as a replacement for white indentured servitude. And in this context, we have the philosophical articulation of John Locke. Now, all of you here are students, like myself, many decades ago, would have been raised up on Locke on liberty. All of us were forced to read his treatise on liberty, and that was the beginning of our consciousness in terms of the articulation of the foundations of political democracy. But John Locke resolved this matter very skillfully for the British and for the Europeans. In his work on liberty, he argued that the African people are outside of humanity and therefore cannot be subject to the principles and the values of democracy. They are outsiders to the concept. Locke was able, therefore, through that mechanism to resolve the contradiction that appeared in Western philosophical thought. It enabled Locke then to become a slave owner. He was a major investor of slavery in the Bahamas. He owned plantation stock in the Bahamas. He was also the corporate secretary of England's largest slave trading corporation. And yet, while accumulating his wealth from slavery and slave trading, he wrote beautifully on the theory of liberty. All of this made perfect sense because he had resolved the contradiction <coughs> to allow the West to go forward with slave owning as in the national interest, while at the same time formulating the theory of democracy and freedom. Then in the 18th century, across the Western world, slavery was defined as in the national interest. Now in every instance, all of those many voices that <coughs> rose up against slavery in Britain, in France, in Germany, in this country, all of those intellectuals and poets and theologians and common folk who turned their minds and their values against slavery were defined as not acting as citizens in their own national interests. And they were brushed aside. All of those opposition voices, and there were many very skillful, passionate opposition voices in the 17th century, in the 18th century, standing against the proliferation of the system of labor and human degradation, those people were brushed aside and pushed aside as not serving the national interest. Remember when Wilberforce made his first great statement against slavery, the king of England, a slave owner and slave investor, call upon him as a member of parliament and threaten him to be very, very careful that you, sir, as a member of the British parliament, you are standing against the national interests. <clears throat> Wilberforce persisted. By the early 19th century, the conversation has shifted. Powerful voices now turn against slavery and slave trading as not in the national interest. And we see in the 1820s the rise of this liberal perspective that says slavery is a crime, slavery is a sin. No one who has Christian values can be a slave owner. And suddenly the, the tide turned against slavery and the British Parliament finally overwhelmed by the argument that slavery is no longer in the national interest, thus emancipation. So we see the rise and fall of this concept, and we see it every day in our lives. All of this is linked directly to the contemporary discourse in this country of the Black Lives Matter movement. This is just the second phase of that movement. In the 17th and 18th century, there was a Black Lives Matter movement the slave owners of this country, of this hemisphere, all argued that black life mattered. In fact, nothing mattered more than black life because the economies were built upon black lives. The inventories of the estates, the productive structures of this country and all of the Caribbean countries 
their accounts, their balance sheets all showed that outside of land, the most valuable asset on the books of every enterprise was black life. And therefore, black life mattered most. Remember that the slave laws of this hemisphere were written to protect black lives. Slave owners could be punished. Slave owners could be and were punished for taking black lives because it was seen as a destruction of the most valuable asset of this hemisphere. The most valuable productive asset of this hemisphere was black life and slave owners could be punished for taking black life. In the Caribbean colonies, you could be punished 15 pounds sterling for taking a black life, even though you were the owner of that black life. It was with emancipation, it was with emancipation across the hemisphere when the black life reduced in its economic significance to white enterprises where black life no longer mattered as much financially that there was this wanton taking of black life. The state and the law no longer protected black life. Those who took black life went unpunished. And therein lies the contradiction that you could take black life a hundred years earlier and pay a heavy price. And now you can take black life and don't take and don't pay that price. I am currently writing a manuscript on the strategies of taking black life. I'm writing a book on the subject, Methods of Punishing Black Folks. And so far, I have identified over 1,800 ways to kill black people. The classical things that you know, the boiling in oil, the hanging, the lynching, the dismemberment, those were just the tip of the iceberg. I have an inventory of over 1,800 methods and means that were used to take black life in this country and in this hemisphere. It became a work of art to devise new ways, new and creative ways to punish and to kill black people. I wish to tell you two small stories before I go any further. In 2008, I was invited by my alma mater, the University of Hull, a university built around the legacy of the great William Wilberforce, humanitarian and justice advocate. To establish an institution for justice in his name, I was honored to do so, and I agreed. There would be a formal ceremony at the Prime Minister's residence at 10 Downing Street. And we would be hosted by Mrs. Blair, the First Lady of Britain. And I was asked to make a few comments after that formal dinner. It was agreed that the institution will be called the Wilberforce Institute for the Study of Slavery and Emancipation. The acronym being WISE. WISE is now a well-established institution in British academia. In my after dinner speech, I thought how much better it would be for the future, for the younger generation of scholars for younger generations of students, if such an important institution would not be called the Wilberforce Institution for the study of slavery, emancipation, and reparations, in which case the acronym would be WISER. <laughs> I was asked politely if it was my intention to undermine British policy, but I made the reference in jest 
but it was the most serious of references you can imagine. Then last year, we had the most extraordinary visit to our University of the West Indies. I had just been appointed Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. As you know, we, we have three campuses, Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad. We have an open campus. We are a university of 65,000 students, the largest regional federal university in the West Indies. And we had the honor and the, ple and the pleasure of hosting President Obama. It was the most extraordinary event. I had the honor of shaking his hand and welcoming him to our university. But in the midst of that welcome, I was so aware that our campus in Jamaica, built on a slave plantation, that our ancestors who had worked on that slave plantation for all of these centuries, our ancestors who had been buried on the campus, and recently we were involved in uh, the building of a new medical faculty. And while the construction was going on, the foundation was being dug, up came these bones from the foundation <coughs> where the medical faculty was going to emerge. We had no idea that we were excavating the slave cemetery of the plantation. We stopped production, did the needful things, the ceremonial things, and so on. And while my mind was engaged in all of that, I was welcoming our esteemed president. And in my spirit, I felt that there was a connection between all of this. I felt a sense that there was a connection between this history and the present. The fact that our ancestors' bones were being dug up as the president was coming to our campus. It was a most extraordinary sensation. And for that reason, that moment, will always resonate with me that that visit of Mr. Obama, our ancestors' bones spoke to us, unearthed and spoke to us, and that there was a message for Mr. Obama. I will speak to that message later on. And so we recognize that I am now the vice chancellor of a university with three campuses, and each campus is built on a slave plantation. I came from Barbados where I was the, the principal or the provost of a campus. And one of the last things I did before I gave up that position was to honor the memory of those enslaved Africans who had worked on that land before the campus was built. We have a monument on the campus called Quas Quest, in honor of a gentleman called Qua. Qua was just three years old when he was brought to Barbados as a slave, aboard a slave ship. His parents had been murdered in a slave raid on his village. The child was thrown onto the slave ship and brought to Barbados. Qua is bought by a gentleman who too has a three-year-old child. And he bought Qua as a present, as a toy for his son. They grew together. Kwa's genius was recognized by his owners. They found that he had, as a child, a phenomenal intellect. Taught himself to read, to write, 
mathematical capacity were extraordinary. They asked him to take responsibility for the accounts of the estate. Slavery comes, slavery ends. A church is built on the plantation. Two weeks at emancipation, the Church of England is looking for a sexton for the new church. The sexton, as you know, is the person, the officer of the church, who takes responsibility for all of the events of the church. Marriages, baptisms, all the public events of a church are taken care of by the sexton. Cor becomes the sexton, the first black sexton of the Church of England anywhere in the world. And in 1854, there's an outbreak of cholera, and he is lying on his deathbed. And he gives his testimony on his deathbed. He says, I came to this colony as a child of three. Parents lost. I am now married, four children. My family is rebuilt. I am a teacher, I'm a preacher, I'm a professional man. My quest is over. And so we call this monument Qua's Quest. The first teacher, the first teacher on the land where a university campus is now built. This is the history all of us have to deal with, how the past speaks to us in the present. Then there is the narrative of one of my predecessors, Sir Arthur Lewis, who I'm sure you all know, Nobel laureate in economics, the first vice chancellor of my university, professor of Princeton, Manchester University, everywhere. One of the finest intellectuals of the modern world. But in 1938, as a young graduate, 23 year old graduate with a PhD in economics, London School, brilliant young man, he wrote a little book called Labor in the West Indies. And in this little book, he says, the economics surrounding the development of modernity are well known. We can all account for the rise of the Western world. We can all account for the emergence of global capitalism. We know the benefits that global capitalism have brought to humanity. But, he says, this matter of 200 years of unpaid slave labor is yet to be addressed. That was before he received his Nobel Prize, 1938. That is what he said. He goes on to argue that until this matter of 200 years of unpaid slave labor that built this modern world is addressed, democracy and the West will be on trial. And that we must find a way, we must find a way to address this matter if we consider ourselves as Democrats. Now, let us historicize that for a moment. That there is a relationship between democracy and what Kuo had experienced. The raid upon his village, the destruction of his parents, and his thrown onto a slave ship to labor in the Caribbean. That we now have on the one hand democracy, but we have a history of terrorism. The slave trade was nothing more than unleash terrorism upon the people of Africa. And this unleashing of terrorism upon the people of Africa went on for 400 years. 
But this terrorism and the democracy that we all are now a part of are connected by this middle passage. We have the records of all of those kings of Africa who stood in the way of the slave trade and slavery. And those who stood in the way of this crime, instructions were given from the British government in the records of the Royal African Company to assassinate those leaders who stood in the way of the slave trade. Understand this, the Western world was in need of cheap labor. Capitalism was in need of cheap labor. African labor was the source of energy that drove the Western enterprise. Fast forward 400 years. We are now having a conversation about alternative energy, renewable energy. The conversation in the 17th and 18th centuries about cheap labor is the same conversation as the conversation today about cheap oil. The language, the narrative, the paradigms are very similar. Cheap labor, cheap oil, energy. And so we had a land grab in Africa, a labor grab, now followed by an oil grab. The energy debate of today is the same debate as the slave trade debate of yesterday. And in much the same way that President Obama's 21st century alternative energy victory must be celebrated it was nonetheless the second part of a conversation launched by Abraham Lincoln for an alternative source of energy to drive the American economy. In other words, slavery was not the energy source that was now required. We now need another source of energy. And so President Obama, President Lincoln, are linked at multiple levels, but they are critically linked in their search for an alternative form of energy to drive the economy of this country. Terrorism, alternative energy, and the contradictions of democracy, as I have said, have been resolved. And now all of us are asked to deal with this discourse around reparatory justice. But those who argue against reparatory justice, when you examine the assumptions of those arguments, whether legal, philosophical, social, moral, whatever the assumptions of the opposition to reparatory justice for African peoples, they converge around a simple point, that the African peoples of the Americas might have a moral and legal right to justice, but they are not deserving of reparatory justice. Unlike all the peoples of the world, these people are not deserving of reparatory justice. Reparatory justice, we all know, is about power. Who gets reparatory justice are those who are able to win the discourse of power. The weak, the disorganized, do not get reparatory justice. Unless it comes at the end of a journey where that group is facing extinction. And when that group is facing human extinction, then the conversation might change around reparatory justice. We have seen this in the context of indigenous people on the verge of decimation being the subject of reparatory justice. The Caribbean has now thrown itself into the vanguard of this process. All of the governments of the Caribbean met in summit 
examine the historical details of this case and have agreed that the powers of Europe, the slave-owning nations of Europe, that they all have a case to answer. CARICOM, the community of the Caribbean, has therefore broken ranks with Europe and America. The Caribbean governments have broken the gridlock. The Caribbean governments have determined that the future of democracy has no integrity without a discourse of repartory justice. And why? Because this is the final stage in the evolution of our democracy. For 300 years, for 500 years, the indigenous peoples, the African peoples fought to remove genocide and slavery from our culture, our civilization. They fought against it. They were in the vanguard of all those democratic sensibilities we speak about, justice, equality, freedom, they fought. After 300 years, we were finally able to uproot slavery from our world, chattel slavery. What the enslaved of the Caribbean describe as the barbarity time. That's how the former slaves used to refer to slavery, as the barbarity time. The time when barbarity descended upon the world. Barbarity. Then it took another 150 years of struggle to get the right to vote, to walk the streets, to live in communities. After 300 years of fighting against slavery, another 150 years of fighting for the right to vote, for civil rights, social justice. Finally, we are in this stage now, final stage, where we are talking about repartory justice for this history. This is where we are. This is not going to go away. This is not going to be brushed under the carpet. This is going to be the world's most powerful and evolving political movement in this 21st century. All over the world, where these crimes have been committed, citizens are going to be rising up and calling for justice. It is a turning point in our culture of the world. It is the beginning of a new dispensation. It is not about retribution and anger. It's about atonement. It's about the building of bridges across lines of moral justice. And I am in full agreement with the Pope who said this is not a time to be building walls. This is a time to be building bridges because we all know what a bridge is. A bridge is just a wall turned the right way up. That's all it is. Or the right way down, as you might wish to imagine. And so we are into building bridges. Bridges across cultures, civilizations, bridges with an objective of world peace. The CARICOM governments have taken that bold step. And they have established a commission of inquiry to carry out the necessary work to formulate a strategy of reparatory justice to move these societies forward. They have approved what is now called the CARICOM 10-point plan, the 10 issues around reparatory justice. Issues about development, housing, healthcare, education, issues about social justice, infrastructural development. Critically, what CARICOM has said is that this mythology perpetrated by those who are against justice, that reparatory justice is about black people standing around on street corners expecting charity from white folk. That is the myth that is used 
by those who campaign against reparatory justice. It's about black folks in a mendicant, subordinate way, looking for charity. Another level, another level of charity. This is what to say. It is not about those issues. I am the chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. I am not and will never be a part of that kind of discourse. I am concerned about the eradication of illiteracy, bad health, bad housing in the societies that have been ravished by slavery. I have said to the British Prime Minister and to the British government in their own parliament, you have left the Caribbean world in a royal mess. You have left the Caribbean world in a royal mess. Come back and help us to clean up that mess that you have created. That is what reparatory justice is about. I live in Jamaica. That is where the Vice Chancellor of the university resides. When Britain gave Jamaica its independence in 1962, 80% of the black folks in Jamaica were illiterate. And this is after 300 years of extracting wealth from Jamaica, the richest colony in their history. The colony that gave them the global push into Asia and everywhere else, Jamaica the land where the prime minister's ancestors made their fortune. 80% of the people were left, and they were told to go and develop. I spent six years as a student in the faculty of economics. I have seen or heard of no economic model, no economic paradigm that will enable a society with 80% illiteracy to develop. The people of Jamaica nonetheless have done very well to convert that mess they have inherited from the British government into a sustainable nation state. And they must be congratulated. All of the Caribbean societies inheriting this mess went to work in an act of self-help to carve nations out of this mess. My island where I was born, Barbados, is very proud of its democratic culture. But this was the first slave society in the modern world. The first society in the Americas where African peoples outnumbered Europeans, Barbados. And now we celebrate Barbados as a center of democracy and freedom because the formerly enslaved people took it upon themselves to build that tradition, to turn slavery on its head and create societies based on freedom and justice. This is our achievement. This is the achievement of people who had been enslaved, to turn history around and point the world in the right direction. And so we are saying, and we are urging, and I can think of no other place to do this than here in Harvard Law, the home of our esteemed president to join with CARICOM. Join with CARICOM. Establish a national commission in this great nation to examine the history and the legacy and the consequences of slavery with a view to build in the foundations for another round of civil rights and human rights in this country. Urgent, urgent that he use his considerable global influence, his considerable global influence to help to shape this 21st century around reparatory justice. And when I had the honor of meeting with him at the University of the West Indies, I felt the ancestors were speaking to me to tell him this, to say to him, welcome to Jamaica, welcome to a slave plantation where we have built a university. We are proud of your achievements as a great leader, but your ancestors are asking you to do one final thing. They are crying out from the graves for reparatory justice. 
And let me say this. How many of you have seen President Obama singing Al Green at the Apollo Theater? On his visit to Jamaica, he said he grew up under the influence of the remarkable music of Bob Marley. Well, I'm going to sing a little Bob Marley for the president. <laughs> Old pirates, yes, they're rabbi. Took I on the merchant ships. Redemption song. Redemption song for the president. Who we are asking to take this one final step. For Bob Marley. For all of us who are committed to reparatory justice. We celebrate what he has done for the people of Cuba. We celebrate the opening he has given for the people of Cuba. Reparatory justice will mean in this country, in the Caribbean, that no child will be able to say, I can't breathe. No child will say, I can't breathe in this civilization, in this land, in this country. Therefore, on the next occasion that I'm invited to this distinguished university, I hope it will be to participate in the open ceremony of the Obama Center for Repartory Justice at Harvard University. <laughs> All of us as academics, as scholars, must stand for justice. We give solidarity to students in this university and all universities around the world who are standing up and demanding that their university environments be ethical environments. I have just visited Oxford University just two weeks ago and had the great honor and privilege of addressing faculty and students at that university, now appointing its first vice chancellor who is female after 700 years. But, I was able to say to students and faculty there, yes, Oxford University has been a part of a certain imperial history that have celebrated and empowered white supremacy, racism, depredation of cultures. And I recommend this to the Vice Chancellor that the way around this, Oxford, the University of the West Indies, the University of Johannesburg where Rhodes is recognized. How about an Oxford, Johannesburg, University of the West Indies Center for Global Justice? Let us turn this history around. We cannot bury it because, as I have said, when we bury this history and we go to put up buildings such as medical faculties, we then dig up the bones. The bones are everywhere. They're everywhere. There's no point in burying the legacy and the memory as well as the bones. Let us bring everything to the surface and find a way, find a way forward through all of this. I thank you for the generosity of your attention. I thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Hillary, for this very moving talk, which, among other things, has shown how relevant the study of history is to our.
contemporary dilemmas into our contemporary politics. We now have three very short responses to this presentation, and then we will open up the floor for discussion. And uh, I very much urge you to stay to be participating in that discussion. Our first commentator is uh, my colleague Ben Brown, who is the Charles Warren Professor of History and Professor of African American and African Studies here at Harvard University, and a multimedia historian with a keen interest in the political implications of cultural practice. He directs the History Design Studio here at Harvard, and he teaches courses in Atlantic history and African diaspora studies and the history of slavery. He's best known as the author of The Reaper's Garden, Death and Power in the World of Atlantic Slavery, and he's currently writing a book about African diasporic warfare in the Americas. Vince. Won't you help to sing <laughs> these songs of freedom? I want to thank uh, Sir Hilary Beckles for a stimulating lecture and for beginning that song, one of my favorite songs, a song which was a lullaby for my first child. Um, I learned much from that lecture, as I always have from Sir Beckles' indispensable scholarship. And I want to express how grateful I am that he's brought his erudition to a campaign of such public significance. In his work on the CARICOM Reparatory Justice Framework, his book, Britain's Black Debt, his speech to the UK Parliament in 2014, and in his tireless efforts on behalf of redress for the legacies of a criminal history. He has set a stellar example of how scholarship can establish links between a past many would rather forget, a haunted present, and a future that depends on comprehensive reckoning with the processes and transformations that have made us who we are. We are the legacies of slavery. European enterprise in the Americas flourished when and where enslaved African labor was most exploited. Slavery made the Americas valuable to Europe, and slaves were the most significant commodities and the most vital producers of goods and services in the Americas beyond the mid-19th century. Just as, surely as some have just as surely as some have inherited the wealth of slavery, others have inherited its losses. The deficit shows up most dramatically in contemporary inequalities between black people and their fellow citizens. Really, wherever in the Americas, slavery was entrenched. For a long time, it has been fashionable to blame inequality on the cultural behavior of the unfortunate. And I mean a really long time. Jamaica's slaveholders even claimed that the high death rates on their plantations were so high because slaves stayed up late drinking and dancing at each other's funerals. In other words, they were killing themselves by mourning their dead. Perhaps it's time to think differently about heritage, less about cultural inheritance than as accumulation of privileges and disadvantages over time. If we can connect our present to the legacies of slaveholding and the damage done to the descendants of the enslaved, perhaps, too, we can articulate a means of repair. A few years ago, the comedic social theorist Louis C.K. reminded Americans that you can't take people's historical context away from them. White people always want to say, come on, it wasn't us. Like, they want black people to forget everything. But the days of slavery in the US were just 150 years ago. That's two 75-year-old ladies living and dying back to back. That's how recently you could buy a guy. In another illuminating bit, the comic raised a more general concern. Maybe every incredible human achievement in history was done with slaves. How did they build those pyramids? They just threw human death and suffering at them until they were finished. How did we traverse the nation with the railroad so, railroad so quickly? We just threw Chinese people into caves and blew them up, and we didn't care what happened to them. There's no end to what you can do when you don't care about particular people. Now, never mind all the things that people have done and can do without slave labor. The central issue here is whether concentration of social power and profit is generally, even essentially, predatory. Let's assume for a minute that it is that the wealth of slavery is a kind of model for accumulated wealth in general. 
Professor Beckles has argued that the owners and inheritors, inheritors of such wealth bear a social responsibility for the crimes of the past. And I think this raises two sets of important questions. First, should responsibility be decoupled from authority, and can it? Is there a tension between the historical responsibility of Europe and the successful independence of its former colonies? Can one have responsibility without authority? And does the invitation to participate in the development of post-colonial states not invite the reassertion of some kind of imperial sovereignty? How do we avoid compromising the hard-won gains of so many struggles for autonomy? And second, what entities should be held accountable? What kind of entity is the appropriate recipient of the claim to reparations? It wasn't always centralized institutions that determined the slave trade or exploited the enslaved. States may have secured and guaranteed a commercial impulse and infrastructure, but private individuals took advantage of dynamic markets. So who exactly is responsible? And how do we get them to accept that responsibility? Even if we zero in on the state, I fear that the demand for reparations presumes and depends upon states committed to distributive justice, a commitment most states haven't borne since the rise of neoliberal gover governance, which, many would argue, is essentially predatory itself. In any case, alignment between the needs of states and nations, governments and publics, is anything but guaranteed. The people who define the national interest don't usually include true democracy as part of it. This raises the question of who inherits accountability in another way. How do we address the predatory states who have long exhausted the benefits of the slave trade and slavery? Can we hold the descendants of Segu, Oyo, Dahomey, and Ashanti accountable alongside those of Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands, Denmark, France, Great Britain, and the United States? Now, I understand that lawsuits generally target only entities that can afford to pay leaving open the question of culpability in principle. But if we pose the demand to states that have inherited the wealth of slave labor, must we also appeal to the very moral, legal, and political traditions of authority that justified enslavement and genocide? And in doing so, do we grant them a legitimacy they do not deserve? Ultimately, the demand for reparation is a moral claim upon states as we wish them to be. As such, the reparations campaigns present states and societies with a test of virtue. If indeed they are to be upheld as more legitimate polities, stewarding the values of fairness, security, and prosperity for inclusive publics, these values can be demonstrated through concrete policies of redress. In this way, while the money would be great, the case for reparations based on specific claims of past harm has as its true goal, for me, a general impulse toward a more equitable future in which we care more faithfully for all those particular people who generate society's wealth. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Annette Gordon-Reed, who is the Carol Wurzheimer Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies here at Harvard, the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School, and a Professor of History also here at Harvard University. Professor Gordon Reed has published widely on the history of slavery and race in the United States and is best known for her 1997 book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, and her 2008 Hemings of Monticello, An American Family, for which she won the 2008 National Book Award, and the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in History. Annette. It's, I'd like to say it's an honor to be here and to listen to that address about a very, very important topic. Naturally, my mind went to the United States when I found that, uh, when I was asked to participate in this, and the situation here um, in, as opposed to the situation that the vice chancellor was descri describing. Very many things that are the same, but some things that are quite different. 750,000 people come to the North American continent, and that by the end of slavery, after the Civil War, that's 4 million people. So it's a very, very different situation. Uh, the way slavery ended is different. Compensated emancipation in Great Britain was a wonderful thing that you actually get to see how much money 
to see slaves turned into capital, to actual liquid capital, to see exactly what, was, uh, what people got in return for uh, giving up slavery. Uh, I was in England last year, and the, the prime minister's family, there was much talk about the prime minister's family and its, his origins and the origins of their wealth in slavery. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, the, uh, the uh, popular actor, whose family uh, uh, owned slaves in, the, in, Bar in um, the Caribbean as well. Much talk about that. And comparing that to the United States, where for many Americans, the notion of slavery is sort of an amorphous thing, some idea of plantation owners, maybe a few famous people who own slaves, but not thinking about it in a monetary way. And I think this has been the great value of the discussion of reparations. One of the, up, up to this point, is to make people understand that slavery was not just a system of holding people in bondage, it was holding people in bondage for a purpose, and that was to make money, to make money off of their bodies. And that that's an important realization that Americans have to come to. So we have the end of slavery after the Civil War, then we have Reconstruction, a period of great promise where laws are passed, and Vice Chancellor talked about law and some of the limitations of law, but law was passed that were supposed to bring African American people into citizenship, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and we know how that went. Uh, a period afterwards where the Supreme Court in retrenchment basically vitiated the goals of those particular amendments, an astonishing moment when there were actually people who thought that they could do this, whites who actually thought that they could bring blacks into citizenship, and we understand that the South was recalcitrant. So we have basically another hundred years of virtual slavery for many African Americans trapped in debt peonage, unable to vote, fighting for their civil rights. And at the core of this was something the Vice Chancellor mentioned when he talks about democracy, uh, as, a, as a value in the Western world. The other thing that's a value in the Western world, and you have to say it, and we like to use the word value in describing this, is white supremacy. And this is the thing that we have not gotten over yet. It is, to my mind, a substantial barrier to people understanding what is at stake here. I, I think it's wonderful, the idea of having a commission. I think we have to keep talking about this and keep pressing on the question. But to my mind, that reality is something that is clear and present today and was allowed the slave trade to go and to, to allow people to feel that if you're going to give money for slavery, you give it to the people who are white and not the people who are black who suffered under slavery. During the period after all of this, we have legalized Jim Crow. We have arms of the government who participate in uh, discrimination against African Americans, the Tulsa riots, all the kinds of things that we know about people within living memory. The problem with slavery here, as we were talking in the law school, reparations for slavery that people cite as well, when you say that it's too big a crime, it's also this question of who has standing to bring these claims, who has been injured, who today has, been, that's the way, the structure of the law, the way, uh, the way the law works today. But for the things that have happened in the 20th century, there are people who are still alive who suffered under the rubric of the many legacies of slavery, white supremacy that kept black people as second-class citizens. And thinking practically about this, um, I would prefer to see, as a start, thinking of those particular things, thinking of those, the things that happened recently, um, the way people, black people were done out of the capacity to buy homes uh, create wealth, all of those kinds of things that happened recently, that there are people in living memory who are alive, who could meet a standing requirement, who could sort of overcome this notion that people are hurt, that we don't know about it, who did the hurt harm. We can figure these things out. As a starting point, I think we need to start with the modern legacies of slavery that have crippled uh, the African-American community and continue to cripple the Af African-American community. There's no question of the debt that's owed. There's no question that slavery was an abomination and blighted the lives of million people and was a form of genocide. There's no question about that. We have to keep this in, in, in the forefront. The commission that the uh, vice chancellor talked about is something that I think is very, very important. But I think that there are concrete things that can be done as a start and maybe work our way backwards. We tend to think of starting with slavery and work our way up but work our way back for it from the modern things that, things that were done to create second-class citizenship, maintain second-class citizenship for African Americans, and go back to the source of where all this is. And this notion of white supremacy, that was 
could discuss this and, you know, what, uh, there's sort of an origins debate. Did slavery uh, cause racism or did racism uh, allow people to hold people as slaves? We'll never probably, I have my own views about that. We may never come to a conclusion, but there's no question that, that this is at the heart of what is going on and has been at the heart at, of the reason, heart of the way that African-American people have been kept out of citizenship in the United States and citizenship in the world colonialism, all of these things are together. There's a key and there's a common denominator. And that is something that I think that the white community has to face and something that the white community has to work on if we're going to have any progress at all. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Thank you. Our next and last speaker is going to be Kenneth Mack, who is the Lawrence Beal Professor of Law and a Professor of History here at Harvard University. Uh, he's the co-teacher of the seminar that, of which this is a meeting here, the, uh, the, 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 the seminar on uh, the history of capitalism in the Americas. And he's also the co-faculty leader of the Harvard Law School program on law and history. Professor Max's research and teaching have focused on American legal and uh, constitutional history with a particular emphasis on race relations, politics, and economic life. And his 2012 book, Representing Race, the Creation of, Civil, of the Civil Rights Lawyer, was selected as the top 50 nonfiction books of the year by the Washington Post and also was a festival selection of the National Book Festival and won many other prizes. And currently, Professor Mack is working on a book that examines the social and political history of race and political economy in the United States after 1975. Okay, okay I'm... Um First, I'd like to thank uh, Sir Beckles for a uh, scintillating lecture and an incredibly important book uh, from which I'll draw part of my comments uh, entitled Britain's Black Debt, Reparations for Caribbean Slavery and Native Genocide. Um, Professor Beckles makes a bunch of different points in the book and in his talk. And I thought I'd just use maybe just five minutes, so bear with me, to bring out some of the points and talk just about how they relate to the question that's on many of our minds uh, about uh, slavery and the memory of slavery and reparations of slavery within the United States. Point number one that he makes is that reparations is not a handle, handout. This is not a case of black people sort of waiting for the government to cut them a check. But in fact, as he documents quite doggedly in his book, the ways in which slavery enriched the nation of Britain and enriched other European powers and also enriched the United States. Um, this is not a question of people looking for charity. It's a question of people whose labor was extracted to enrich certain institutions, many of which exist today, like Harvard Law School. Um, second, in his Analysis, he, what, what makes it a little easier for him than uh, those of us who are thinking about the United States is that he's got two state parties, right? There are Caribbean nations and there are European governments, and mostly the UK. Um, in the United States, it's a little bit different. Um, we actually do have a state that's responsible on one side, arguably the United States government or many of the states that sanction slavery under their law, but we don't quite have a state on the other side. Um, it's a little bit harder to think about how the process works here. Um, but the process for the Caribbean, it seems pretty simple. There was, in fact, a nation whose citizens were injured in very tangible, documentable ways by another nation. And Sir Beckles calls for some reparatory justice. A little bit harder in the United States. Fine. Uh, third, um, Professor Beckles emphasizes that these are political questions. This is not a question of filing a lawsuit in the courts. In fact, the, the kinds of questions that are raised by what we're talking about here are, are probably beyond the capacity or even the institutional competence of the courts. Um, 
in the early 2000s, there was a period in which within the United States, there was a big push to file lawsuits for reparations. And I think the, the, the best one, the one that had the most traction was the lawsuit um, for recompense for the Tulsa race riots in which whites, with the complicity of state authorities, destroyed the black business district of Tulsa, Oklahoma, which never re recovered. There were live plaintiffs. The lead plaintiff was John Hope Franklin, the famous historian who lived there at the time. Um, there was documentable harm. There was state complicity, and you couldn't even win that one. Um, reparations is a political process. Professor Beckles rightly says that uh, states, legislatures, executives will have to resolve it. And in fact, um, one of our famous instances of reparations in, is, involves um, two states who did it through a political process, Israel and West Germany. Um, the other thing that Professor Beckles notes is that people sort of say, uh, you know, why bring it up? It was all legal at the time. But as Professor Beckles says quite clearly, many, many things are crimes under international law that in fact are legal, were legal, under the laws of the nations in which they were committed. Um, that is no bar to thinking of this as a crime. Moreover, what Professor Beckles talks about very, very specifically is how within Britain, and the West Indies, and actually in the United States. There was acknowledgement over and over and over again that a crime was being committed. Even though slavery was sanctioned under the law in the West Indies, slavery could not exist in Britain because of the Somerset decision. Slavery could not exist in Britain where it did not have the sanction of positive law. British people had abolished their own forms of coerce ser servitude or were on their way of, to doing it and understood that this was a crime against humanity which they would not allow to exist within the home country. Similarly, in the United States, yeah, it's very complicated, but the Somerset decision, which meant that slavery could only be legal where it was valid under positive law, meant that if you, orig the original rule in the United States was if you tra traveled from a state in which slavery was sanctioned by law, to a state where slavery was not sanctioned by law, you were free. Why so? Because of the same rule as Somerset, slavery, in fact, was something that was contrary to the way that one human being should treat another, and we would only sanction it when it was recognized in positive law. Um, I, I want to also commend Professor Beckles for his objective. People say, why would you want reparations. He says over and over again, we want reparations for reconciliation. Well, there is certainly anger in the Professor Beckel's presentation, anger at the crime of slavery, at the horror of slavery, but there is no anger at the present populations of the countries that did it. Professor Beckel's emphasizes that reparations, it's, it's he doesn't view it as a divisive process. He views it as a process that leads to reconciliation between those who were injured and have not been, had their injuries repaired and the nations that injured them. His goal is a conversation between equals, not a kind of dredging up of hate of the past and of demonizing whites or demonizing Britain. I mean, that is the tone in which Professor Beckles has conducted this advocacy, and he should be commended for doing so. Finally, let me say uh, just a little bit about our own. Um, I think my five minutes is almost up, so I'll use maybe one minute and say a little bit about our own um, encounter with this issue. Professor Beckles uses this metaphor of bones that, in fact, at the University of West Indies, they unearth the bones of enslaved persons, just as President Obama visited. We, of course, have had our own unearthment of bones here at our institution. I refer, of course, to the 
recent bringing to light. Now, it's been known for a long time. You know, if you read a little bit, it was easy to find out that uh, Harvard Law School was endowed with the proceeds of slavery and was Harvard University endowed its first professorship in law in part because of the, a slave revolt, revolt, which was brutally, and I mean brutally, put down in Antigua. And in fact, Harvard Law School today exists in the form that it does in part because of the repression of the slave revolt. It endowed the first professorship of law at an American university. It enabled Harvard to get a head start over other universities. It enabled Harvard Law School by 1830 to basically become what it is today, a national law school, right? That people all over the country went, came to come here and study national law and go back to their institutions. So as a graduate of this law school and as a professor here, I have to think, you know, I benefit from this the proceeds of the repression of this slave revolt. And what should we do about it? Now, the what is very hard for the reasons I've articulated. You know, Harvard Law School itself, of, of course, didn't put down the slave revolt. There is no sort of state on the other side. Uh, but we can think about what we should do if we understand that all of us benefit from the proceeds of slavery every day if we're associated with this institution. Uh, all of us derive a present-day benefit from the oppression and degradation of human beings. And what should we do as an institution to make reparations for that original sin, even if we cannot find particular people to pay? What mission should we undertake? These are the kinds of things that uh, should be on our agenda when we think about that fact. And so thank you, Professor Beckles, for all of what you've done. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. And thank you also for pointing out that this very global story is also a very, very local story. Uh, we now have approximately 15 minutes for questions and comments. And as you can see, there are two microphones. So if you would like to speak, I would uh, ask you to move closer to these uh, microphones. So who, who wants to go? Who wants to go first? Microphones here and here. Julian, OK. OK. Hi. Hi. Can, can you introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, my name is Rena Karifa Johnson. I'm a third year at the law school. Um, my questions were actually for Professor Gordon Reed and, Gordon Reed and Professor Mack. Um, you spoke a little bit about how this is a local story, and Professor Beckles spoke a lot about how, you know, it's important to stand in solidarity with students who are fighting to make their universities more ethical institutions. And Professor Gordon Reed, you really emphasized the fact that white supremacy is alive and well. And I had a question for both of you, kind of with those themes. Um, what other than the shield do you see as manifestations of white supremacy at this school? Um, and how do you take it upon yourself to stand in solidarity with the students who are fighting against that here? OK, um, a couple of different things. Uh, one is that there are manifestations of white supremacy everywhere you look in American society. Um, you know, we're, there, there, there is a collective amnesia that, um, that pervades these kinds of issues um, within my lifetime. You know, the, the town that I live in in Massachusetts, when I was a kid, if you were black, it was almost impossible to buy a house there because no realtor would show you a house. Um, you know, it, it is, you know, when we think about slavery, you know, we don't even have to go that far back. We can go back <laughs> to well within my lifetime to find manifestations of white supremacy. They're all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, now, slavery is a little, different, you know, we have to kind of, it, it is harder for me to tell a story in which, you know, Harvard Law School, you know, that the original sin sort of perpetuates itself, but it seems to me that we are all enriched by that original sin. As I said, we are all, we are as an institution enriched by that original sin 
uh, we all benefit from that original sin, and there should be some obligation to do something in response. Um, so there's kind of two issues, right? There, there's white supremacy, which is kind of, you know, it has its source in slavery, but in fact was very much recognized as a cultural norm that was taken for granted by Americans well within my lifetime. Um, it's not hard to find it um, manifesting itself in every institution here, uh, every institution in American life, including uh, our own law school. Um, but that's about as much as I should say. Do, do you have any examples, though, was my question. I, I know it's everywhere, but... I, um, I kind of hesitate to give examples because I would give a whole lot of them, and many of them are very personal. Um, so, no, I, I don't want to give public examples, but they are easy to find. Okay. What? what? <laughs> Open yourself up to lawsuits, is that the idea? Um, yeah. What I try to do is to be as supportive of students as I can, and I think that it's probably through my scholarship. Um, I've devoted my life to trying to uh, expose and talk about um, the legacies of slavery in the United States and how they operate. So that's my, I think that, that that's my chief thing to do, you know, to show up when students ask me to show up. Uh, and when students of color and other students as well, whoever asked to show up when they asked me to do that. And through my work and to speaking out about it. And do you have any... Thing you want to say about like manifestations of white supremacy at Harvard Law School specifically, other than the shield? Other than the shield? Uh, no, not really. I, I don't think it's inappropriate because a lot of this, what he's saying, that it's, it's a lot of things that could be personal. Uh, and but it's aren't we talking about like a reckoning, right? Like with our history and, and mm -hmm. kind of. Well, you give me an example besides the shield. Oh. Well, we have a, a whole list of demands printed, um, I would say. But that's not, I mean, this, the, I mean the makeup of our faculty. The way that the we makeup learn. of the faculty. What do you mean? Well, how many black professors are there on the faculty? Twelve. How many white male professors are there on the faculty? I don't know how many there are. How many, many black? Account. How many black people are lawyers? But the percentage. There's another manifestation of white supremacy. That's a manif Well, that three percent. Uh, three percent of the profession um, is yeah. is black. That's a small number. I think that's connected to this and law that's, school rather than. The reverse. Oh no, no! Issue. It's a part. I mean, the law school is a part of the the legal the legal system. Surely, the system of legal education does not have enough African American people in it. Do you mean, obviously, that that's that's a part of a, that's an education problem? It's a problem of 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 the differentials in schools, uh, property taxes yeah. that fund uh, places communities more you know lavishly than other places. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I didn't mean to get into back and forth. No, no, that's that's the end result of that. The end result of that is in in medical school. I mean, for talking about law school, we do better in law school than we do in the PhD program. Certainly, uh, all of those things. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, my, my name is uh, Julian Bonder. I'm an architect and professor of architecture. I'm working on issues of memory and public space. And I want to ask, uh, to make a quick comment and ask uh, maybe the panel and, and Sir Hilary Beckles perhaps to expand on one, one particular point that I would like to ask. The first thing is that it appears that we're talking about an idea of protest. But protest in the sense that, you know, it's connected pro and testis, to become a witness. You know, and in a certain way, a witness that denounces the wrongs in society. Uh, and to me, that's a very interesting thing that connects to the idea of interruption of history, which I mentioned before. So the, the basic question is, what I understand the invitation is not only to consider history as historiography, but history in the, presence, in the present uh, as a way to become, uh, to invite all of us from wherever we come to become public intellectuals to engage with the public, to engage with transformation you know, of society. So I'd like to see if you could speak a little bit more about this idea of you know, historians you know, interrupting the continuity of the history of victors, you know, which is what part of this conversation is about. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a kind of mythology of, of sorts that historians uh, focus on the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've... <laughs> I've really never considered Minecraft in that way. Uh, my own view has been that from the very beginning, historians uh, have tried to marshal uh, data in order to see where in their judgment this society is really seeking to go. So that you, you analyze the ideas, the visions, the concepts, the philosophies, and you ask yourself the question, where is this society trying to go? What are the, what are the targets it's trying to reach? We, we listen to all the conversations uh, at any moment in time. Where is this culture and civilization heading? And you try to imagine that, that point. And then if you, if you subscribe to the nobility of that vision, uh, then you say, well, if that's the case... Well, these are some of the things that you have to avoid. These are some of the things you have to do. So I have always seen myself really as seeking to forge the future mm. and, and, to, and to craft conversations to, to engineer where the civilization is really heading. Uh, and this is why I speak the way I do about reparatory justice, because I believe that most of the societies in which we live, they are seeking towards a certain kind of social order. Uh, and oftentimes, they do not know how to get there, and of course, there are obstacles, there are contradictions, and you try to move there, which is why I subscribe to the notion that you, you speak to the now and to the future. Uh, reparatory justice, in my view, uh, be- begins with understanding the jet stream of slavery. Yes, the thing called status slavery has been abolished, yes. But we are now living in the jet stream of it. And I don't subscribe to the notion that we place tremendous emphasis on these historical markers, like, you know, 1868, 1838, and these are great moments of transition. That's nonsense. These are processes that continue in different shapes and different forms. So what we are looking at today are early 21st century manifestations of 19th century issues, 20th century issues, and they're all evolving and connected. So yes, the historian, in my judgment, uh, is uh, by virtue of the the logic of that craft, uh, future makers. Uh, If you subscribe to the concept called democracy, and if you have a notion of what that is, And if you wish to live in a world that's democratic, as you understand democracy, then you will know what are the obstacles getting in the way of that process. And you will know what are the things you have to do. And you would need to know how things evolve to achieve that target. So we are making the future. We are imagining it, and we are trying to make it. And in a sense, historians are like midwives. You know, you're you're really trying to find the least painful way to get things done. And, and oftentimes, that is the nature of these, of these conversations. So public, public advocacy is one role. Scholastic work is another role. I know that many young academics have difficulty in trying to balance the two. Mm-hmm. And uh, I sit as the chairman of my university's promotions committee. And I sit on the committee, I chair the committee by which my academics become professors or not become professors. Mm -hmm. And I try to make a distinction between scholastic, intellectual, original, pioneering work and work of public education for general consumption. We do not oftentimes ascribe equal value to all of this, but we have a role for it. And therefore, we have our public intellectuals, we have our scholastic work, and we see the value of all of it. And then we try to find a way to make sure that the individual in pursuit of their craft uh, receives the justice. It's, it's, it's complex, but we try. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. 
Uh, my name is Magda Mataki. I'm an instructor at Harvard University, but I'm probably more important for this discussion. I'm a member of a uh, minority group in, in Europe, which was um, part of the slavery process for 500 years. I speak about the Roma or the so-called gypsies in mm. more derogatory terms. So I have two questions, short questions, and I think they are both connected to this idea that you mentioned uh, related to the fact that the 21st century is basically the uh, turning point in the culture of the world. And reparations is part of the global discussion. And pr the first question goes in relation to the United Nations working group of experts on people of African descent, which um, just recently published a uh, press release and a report will come up uh, arguing for reparations in the, in the United States or advising the United States of America to, to provide reparations to the, the African-American community here. And I wonder how that um, decision of the working group plays in relation to, to your advocacy w w uh, work on, on reparations for slavery, and also knowing the, the previous work of some of the, of the governments in the Caribbean uh, uh, arguing the United Nations to give reparations to um, to push Britain and the other states in Europe to, to give reparations to, to these states. And my second question, again, in, in the framework of reparations and global conversation on this, is how would reparations on slavery be part of a conversation that is not focusing only, only on slavery, but on other state-sponsored injustice that happened throughout the world? Uh, thank you for that. Um, last year, when I was asked to give the feature address to launch the decade of African descendant people in uh, the General Assembly of the UN, uh, as I approached the podium, I, I recognize the tremendous and enormous diversity of political opinions on this subject. There are some countries that recognize that the evolution of their civil rights process requires an engagement. There are some countries that recognize that the integrity of their democracy as constitutionally framed and socially lived requires that engagement. There are some countries that believe that uh, uh, these are discourses of the poor, the dispossessed, and the weak, and you ought not to accommodate yourself to the thinking of these social groups. That civilizations do not advance when they give in to the moralistic thinking of the powerless and the propertyless and the weak. And there are some societies built on that premise of the, the autocracy of elites and property owning classes. Uh, there are those who do not believe in the concept of ethnic equality. They believe that the, the ideal world is a world that is, that is vertically structured, mm -hmm. that there are ethnicities, there's, there's, there's a model, a template, and that template says white, brown, black. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of pyramid structure of the world. Now, the, the fact is that that's a model that was first discovered by the Europeans in Asia. Uh, the Europeans did not create that model. Uh, the Europeans went into India in the 14th century and saw that model in India, uh, a civilization structured along lines of color. Uh, and, and therefore, the, the, the white Indians, the brown Indians, the black Indians, uh, and that structure they saw and thought, well, this is applicable to colonization. And so the Europeans took that model and translated it and transferred it to the Americas and brought it here and eventually globalized it. Which is why many people have said that today, uh, India is the last remaining apartheid civilization in the world because it's still color structured and the black skinned Indian people are still trapped in tremendous constitutional difficulty. So yes, there is that. So you go into an environment to speak to a world that is not vertical but horizontal where all cultures, all civilizations, all peoples are placed on an equal footing. So you want to turn the world from, from vertical 
to horizontal to allow everyone to have their own space and to function in an integrated organic way. You go into a, an assembly of the UN and you have all of these views and opinions there. You have societies that are managed by royal families who cannot imagine equalities of peasants and laborers. You have societies where working people who are the descendants of slaves and serfs and indentured servants have risen up to become presidents and prime ministers. All of these diversities exist in that space, and believe me, it's very, very complicated. Even in Africa, in our ancestral circumstance, those complexities exist. Some African countries are very keen to engage this conversation. Uh, many African countries are not keen to engage it for multiple reasons. So, yes, there are challenges. And uh, in the UN, you look across the aisle and you ask, how is it humanly possible to move this diversity and complexity forward? I, I admire those who can. Uh, at Durban in 2001, when we tried to, to achieve this, again, the Caribbean world and uh, the African diasporas found themselves uh, out on a limb with no support. Mm -hmm. We were very disappointed that uh, when we demanded that reparatory justice be discussed, we were dip uh, disappointed that Asia did not join with us. We were disappointed that most of the African prime ministers and presidents did not support us. We were disappointed that Europe and the, America, the Americans were not there. We were disappointed that Europe did not support, uh, supported us. And they did what they had to do for multiple reasons. But I can tell you this. There were two values and two emotions at work in both Durban and later on in the UN. But Durban especially. One. Shame and fear. There was a lot of shame uh, in that place. There was a lot of fear that democracy is going to unleash forces that will topple the dominance of property classes. So there was fear and there was shame. Wherever you find fear and shame, you find anger. The, the, coexist in the same space. And there was a lot of anger in Durban. And there, I have said this in several places, I do not know what it would have been like to be an enslaved person on a plantation in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Jamaica, or any other place. But I felt that way in Durban. I felt that if I could have been lynched in that room, I would have been lynched. I saw the rope, I felt the fear, and I understood the history. And the way in which some of the European delegates were looking at me, and I'm not hypersensitive, <laughs> I'm a pretty tough-skinned guy, but I, I felt tremendous hatred as if I had emerged from the depth of hell. <laughs> and I thought I need to write about this because it was the first time in my life, and I grew up as a teenager in the inner cities of England. And like most kids in inner cities, you have to be careful. I know I navigated through that British world as a teenager, but Durban in that United Nations conference was the first time I felt I felt hatred as an individual. So this is the world in which we're living. But guess what? Each generation is moving this process along. And I believe that across the world, the younger people are saying that the crimes of modernity, all of those things that have happened to make this modern world what it is, we need to get to the root of them, we need to resolve them, and we need to go forward in a different way. And that's why I'm really honored and privileged to be a part of a conversation that is seeking to push the world along in a better direction for the younger people. Hi, uh, hi my name is Sam Koplowitz. I'm a 3L here. Um, I, so uh, I didn't really find uh, Rena's, the response to Rena's question very responsive. Um, and I want to kind of open it up to the rest of the panel and try once again. Um, is there any ways uh, that you guys see 
that Harvard Law School is not, be, is not engaging in reparative justice in which it could be, aside from the shield and aside from anything that might be too personal to expose today in this open forum, I can't imagine that there isn't something between, between those two. That's a different question. Yeah. But um, were you going to? You want me to reform Harvard Law School for y'all? I want me to reform Harvard Law School for y'all. I, I mean, I. Go ahead, Ken. Oh, you know, look around. There is rampant racial inequality in this world. Look around Boston. Um, go to the parts of Boston that people don't go to when they attend Harvard Law School. Look at Black Lives Matter. Um, anywhere you look, you will see rampant racial injustices that are not focused on at Harvard Law School. Um, I think the answer to that question is easy. Um, so, you know, other people might want to say other things, but, um, you know, all you have to do is walk around Boston and look at issues faced by people of color and, you know, look at what we do at Harvard Law School and you will find that uh, those issues are addressed in places, uh, in instances, but not in the mainstream of the law school curriculum, and they have never been. So Professor Gordon Reed, I think, rightly acknowledged that, that the law school is probably doing better than the FAS and, and probably better than the history department in this regard. Um, and what we think in the history department, our role is, is in investing, first as a principal, a priority, and then with resources in the training, recruiting, and retention of people who are historically disadvantaged. Um, now, diversity is the word that has come to be used for that, but I prefer the word redress, which I, I think is illegal, which is probably why you can't even use it in, <laughs> in Harvard Law School, right? But for me, redress is the principle that has to be sustained, um, rehabilitated, argued for, and then established and, and, and made a priority. Um, but if you're not training, recruiting, and retaining people at all levels of the pipeline, right, from primary education up through secondary education into graduate school, well, then you're not going to solve this problem. Because as Professor Gordon Reed said, it is systemic. And it's, it's accumulated over generations. Um, it's not something that you can solve overnight with one person in the right job. Right? It has to be something that we all commit to and commit resources to. Um, if Harvard Law School has one advantage, I think it's got more money than, than the FAS and certainly than the history department. Um, so you could commit those resources probably sooner than we could. Okay, I didn't want to crack on the history department. We did very, very well uh, <laughs> this year in uh, recruiting I people. I didn't, I didn't no, I was on the committee, and we, no, we, we've never done as well um, as we've you know, as, as before, I think it's a record for that. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's systemic. Uh, it's what you feel that I felt from the time I grew up in Texas. I mean, to, it's sort of to, the idea of plucking one particular thing out of something that is pervasive is very difficult. And I think I would ask, maybe you don't want to go back and forth, but have you experienced a place in the United States where it did not exist. Um, no. Okay. But but I, I guess my my question is not uh, my question is to is hoping to look uh, critically at the law school um, and specifically specifically look at our community and see where we can change something here um, because as you're saying it's hard to change everything, but this is a powerful place. Um, and I think there are things that we can change here. Um, and, you know, I think this is a, a, a great panel that I'd love to hear how we can start engaging in reparations, maybe not necessarily financial, but other ways today. Can I, can I just suggest a personal story to Please. help to illuminate this? As an undergraduate student, uh, in Britain, uh, University of Hull, 
we discovered that our university was a major investor of its resources in South Africa in the apartheid period. Nelson Mandela's in jail. The university's resources are invested in stocks and bonds in South Africa because that market offered a better return on investment than the British market. Our university was built around, as I said, the legacy of William Wilberforce. As students, we thought this was contradictory. Well, first, in itself, as immoral, but secondly, in the fact that a university built around the legacy of a freedom, a freedom fighter, a man who stood for justice, and I'm a great fan of Buxton and, and Wilberforce and all of those who said this is wrong, this is sinful, this is evil, and dedicated their lives to, to illustrate that point. And we went to our chancellor, and we said as students, as students, we wish to live in an ethical environment. We wish our university to stand for the highest values, and we cannot accept, as students of this institution, that our university is invested in Southern Africa in apartheid, supporting this 20th century version of slavery. We were very pleased after several weeks and weeks and months of advocacy that eventually our university's leaders recognized the wisdom of this, moved to establish the integrity of the institution, and withdrew all of their investments from any company that had South African roots. This was a great triumph for the students. We felt that we were doing the right thing for our alma mater, for our students our campus. Subsequent to that event, students in other universities across Britain did the same. We launched a national divestment campaign. And right across Britain, all students, all universities were pulling their investments out of South Africa and companies that were involved in South Africa. I recall the vice chancellor looking at me and saying, now listen to me, young man. This university has been here and will be here. Students come and students go. But this university will stay. And be very careful. Students come and students go. University will stay. Well, I'm happy to report that he was asked to go before I was asked to go. <laughs> And I look back now to my alma mater, very proud of it. In fact, the current vice chancellor of Hull University is a South African. Mm. But I'm very proud of what we did and the consequences of that. But if we had not done that, I do not believe that British universities would be what they are today. And let me tell you this. When you run the fear of being dismissed from your institution, and you're a young person, you're a teenager, and you are finding your way in the world, and you're moralists, and you're humanists, and you want justice, and you're confronting organized power, it is not easy. Mm. It is not easy to, organize, to confront organized power of professors and chancellors and, and provosts. It's, it's daunting. Mm. You fear victimization. What are you going to tell your parents when you go home? <laughs> you, you went to college, and you took up a struggle, and now you're back home. OK, stupid. Now. But you have to do what, in your judgment, is the right thing. And I think when you, when you do that, you, you find solidarity with your fellow students. You find young people of similar minds. And you make an impression for your time. <coughs> Believe me, one day, you'll be a vice chancellor yourself. And you will look back, and you will feel very proud that as a, as a young person, you acted with integrity. Great. We have now three more people who want to speak, and I would just ask you to speak one after the other, and maybe then you can give a short response to them. And now we have four people. So please keep it relatively short, because we are already 50 minutes over time here. I want to take a shot at asking a um, question in a more simpler way that my peers were probably trying to ask. Give me two concrete ways that Harvard, with its renowned name and $39 billion in endowment, can put in effect a plan and be an example, show an example as how we can 
provide reparations to the people of color and brown people all over the world? How can our work set an example do that? What is a concrete plan? We can have these discussion, but I love this discussion, but at the very end of the day, we need to walk out of here with people's minds, with plans of, you know, this is what we can do about reparation. This is, this is something we're, where we can go. And I think that's what they're trying to ask. As faculty members running, ask. you know, what is a concrete plan? ARPA's most radical plan that you see yourself that Harvard can do with that money, with its renowned name. Can you not answer that question? That, that's not the question I thought they asked. You asked a different question. The thing that you could do, a concrete thing that people could do would be investigate situations like Chicago, where contract buying, as I mentioned before, kept African American people out of home ownership as the principal means of property. The things that the whole, the whole largest item of property that most people hold in the United States is that. Educate yourself about the history. Educate yourself about what's going on. We can, and students become involved in that, become involved with that and other students. That, that's a concrete thing. That's not the same thing as asking us to say what here at this particular place is racist. There are things that are going on in the community, things that are going on out where that lawyers could, in fact, address themselves to. And that's what we should be doing. That's separate than what we think about what's going on here. One plan, I would say, I and mean, the research are out there. We know racism out there. We understand white supremacy. It's not like there's not research done out there in the housing market in um, Chicago. Tanasi Kotis just write an article. No, I'm just saying we could, no, not write an article. Students could become involved in talking to people about that. Yes. To maybe to redress those kinds of things. People who were harmed. Um, Beryl Sauter, a friend of my, uh, a, 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 a um, colleague of mine uh, from Rutgers, wrote a wonderful book about it uh, that people could educate themselves about. Ta Coates has written about it to look at those situations and see if there's some legal means, some way that we could have some in intervention in what happened in those situations and provide redress for people. That's I, a concrete thing. I understand the, the, the student, the power of the student, but, I, I, but I'm talking to the power, speaking to the power of Harvard as an institution. You have lawyers, you're sending out lawyers out here, and Harvard could very much fund a group of lawyers with its own donation money to fight these things, but it does not. These are concrete ways Harvard could, yes. I agree I mean, with you, that's yes. what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, we're not dis in disagreement. Can I say to you also, can I say to you, don't ask your professors what you think they, sh they should do. <laughs> <laughs> you will never get the right answers from your professors. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> never ask your professors what you should do in terms of advocacy. You do what your generation think is right. Nobody should you ask anybody that. else what to do. do I, 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 will, I will add to that. Right? Nobody should ask anybody else what to do. Absolutely. It's in your own heart to do it. Students, Let your generation's whatever. voice shape the environment. Don't ask your professors what to do. They will never tell you what to do. And if they tell you what to do, it is not what you ought to do. <laughs> Shape your own view of the world, act upon it, and press on from there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. you yeah. before me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I have a two-part uh, question and a brief comment. First question, uh, Sir Hillary. Um, I really f uh, I appreciate your comments, but I feel you left us hanging. <laughs> I need to know... As the bones spoke, what did Obama say? You didn't tell us. I need to know what his response was. There, there clearly seems to be a, um, some tension around the response to the student's question. Um, the, I would, not being from here, not from this institution, I don't tell other people what they should do. Uh, however, I think there is a body of literature, uh, specifically in relationship to Brown University, that could help this, uh, the students reflect on some opportunities as we are looking to address institutions of higher education. But in the context of Brown, and also the comments of the panel, which I appreciated uh, all of the responses, um, I had one contention with my brother here, um, uh, looking at the framework of our absence of state power in the context of the United States, uh, which is absolutely true. However, I don't believe that 
the issue of reparations is determined simply by state power, and I'm not, perhaps I'm not supposed to say that here, nor by <laughs> law. Mm -hmm. It's a question of power. And all power is organized. And if we look simply at the case of Japanese Americans or the Aleuts who do not have state power, there was reparations determined there. It's a question of power. The sister raised the issue of white supremacy. Thank you very much for bringing that to the forefront. But white supremacy exists as a dialectic. And in opposition to this issue of the internalization of racial superiority is the internalization of racial oppression. And while we speak to this issue and we have organized now, we thank those in the Caribbean for raising this up again, who have state power and are now challenging us here and in Europe. And we have, in fact, a member of the National African American Reparations Commission here who has taken up this call. We internally have to address the question of power. And if we go, were to go out here on Blue Hill Avenue, a Warren Street, and raise this question, people would not believe that it was possible. Not that they don't believe in reparations, but we have internalized so much that construct, we don't believe it's possible. Now, my question to you is, in the Caribbean, now having advanced this, but understanding, I, I think you would un, uh, think that the commission is in fact in advance of where the consciousness of the mass of people are, how do we bridge that gap in building the movement that can really challenge for power? Okay. I thank you for that. Can, can you? Yeah, um, Sir Hillary, once again, pleasure to see you. My name is Yvette Modest, and I am one of the members of the National African American Reparations Commission. And my, my, I have a twofold question, and we've had some a little bit of this conversation of where do you see CARICOM entering into the conversation of the Caribbean labor that was brought to Latin America, specifically Panama, in the construction of the Panama Canal, where the predominant workers of the canal were of Caribbean descent, and face another level of structural and uh, reparations and racism with Jim Crow imposed laws in the American territory in Panama. How does that fit into CARICOM seeking reparations for the Caribbean and the impact of the Caribbean in Latin America? So that's one part. Second part, Durban, those that stayed of the African diaspora were part of the 150 million people of African descent in Latin America who have no access to education and are you know, dealing with the Spaniard ruling of Latin America and the lack of recognition of those black populations in Latin America. Where does CARICOM, or even now as, as a member of the National African Reparations Commission, how that impacted those black communities then and how it's still impacting us now because we are still not visible or counted or even known in certain Latin American countries that we exist. Right. Thank you so much. And I think we have one last comment or question. No, so this is it. So if you could quickly, if possible, respond. Okay. Um, in the CARICOM reparatory justice movement, we, we do not think uh, in geographical terms. We are very clear that the 15, 20 million Africans who were dropped off in different ports in this hemisphere have created these linkages of solidarity. Uh, some slave ships came to New York, some came to Boston Harbor, some came to the Caribbean. Uh, how many people know that Rio was the largest slave important port in the hemisphere? So the ships went everywhere. The fundamental difference and we've heard of the diversity of the journeys of African peoples across the hemisphere and we know those differences. The Caribbean is a case where the descendants of those enslaved peoples have been able to secure state power, okay? Uh, in the US, uh, that circumstance is quite different. In the Caribbean, the descendants of the enslaved peoples are the prime ministers, the presidents, the mayors, the professors, the everything. So we have emerged out of the slavery and we have state power. 
In Brazil, to some extent, this is also the case, but Brazil has a plantocracy and an economic elite that is Portuguese that still has tremendous power in that space. So we have different environments. So in the CARICOM space, we see ourselves as maybe acting on behalf of all of our family at this moment because we have an opportunity to do so. But we've always seen the movement as one. It has always been one movement. Uh, you know, when Dr. King wanted to relax and get away from the trenches in this country, he would go to Montego Bay. He would go to Montego Bay in Jamaica to relax, to come back here. Uh, Malcolm's mother came out of the Caribbean. Farrakhan came out of the Caribbean. All of the people, we've always had this. Marcus Garvey came out of the Caribbean, came here, participated, went back. That has always been the hemispheric journey. So we have a window in the Caribbean where something miraculous has happened. As in this country, as in Brazil, as in Central America, the reparatory justice movement was carried by civil society. Civil society movements, grassroots organizations, community groups. But suddenly in the Caribbean, that movement after 100 years the state thought it appropriate to come on board. So for the first time in 200 years, we have had the convergence of civil society and state in agreement on the subject. That was historic. And the CARICOM Commission is really the result of this interesting merger of civil society and the state in agreement that Europe has a case to answer and the case must be put and will be put. Now, it's a CARICOM initiative, 17 sovereign nations of the Caribbean region. Uh, Belize is a part of that, but not Panama. So we are working towards the establishment of commissions in Brazil, in Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, all of these communities, we are working with groups to build their national commissions so that we can uh, enable the CARICOM nation to receive associate representation from all of these states to act on their behalf when the time comes. So we are very proud that there is an African-American, uh, African uh, Reparatory Justice Commission and that you have been a part of that, your, your brother has been a part of that, I am happy to be a part of that. Mr. Rojas next to you is a part of that. And we've had joint meetings. And we're going to have many meetings in the future because it is our thinking that in the very near future, uh, hopefully either later this year or next year, there will be a global summit, a global summit of all of these national and international reparatory justice committees meeting to chart a global path. This is a global crime. It can only be addressed in a global fashion. And we are also speaking about commissions in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia, and all of those countries in the Middle East where Africans were imported across the Sahara into Islamic societies, into those countries. We've also established one in India because Africans were being taken through Mombasa, the Kenyan, across the Indian Ocean into Southern Asia. All of these groups have to come together to address this. And next year will be the year when we will have this global summit. But I can say to you uh, for now, it is a constitutional fact that there is a CARICOM commission. But we see this as just a legal device and a moment where an opportunity has arisen. And we hope that in taking this step, we hope that we are facilitating the struggle of all of our brothers and sisters. Great. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we will have to come to an end now, but I think this discussion has shown the urgent need to continue to have these kinds of debates here at Harvard University and to have it, these debates about our very local situation, but also to embed them within this much, much gl uh, larger global conversation. And I want to very much thank Sir uh, Hillary for joining us today, traveling all the way from the West Indies to be here, and also all commentators for being part of this panel. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.